Hi everyone and welcome to Kaizen Sports. Today we're going to do a range of different throwing activities and all you'll need is if you're at home you'll just need a normal sock. If you're at school just quickly go to the scrap paper drawer and just get a little piece of paper that you can use. We always recycle when we have the chance. If you're at home take your sock and all you're going to do is make it into a ball by rolling it up over and over again and that should give you a ball that you're going to use. If you're at school and you've got your piece of paper, as always, we're just going to give it a bit of a scrunch. You can scrunch it quite lightly so that the ball's nice and big, which makes the games much easier. But if you want an extra challenge, scrunch the ball up much further to make it smaller. The smaller it is, the harder it's going to be to catch. So I'll give you a minute to do that. And it's a bonus if you have a drink handy as well, because the exercises that we're going to be doing are going to be very difficult and very tiring. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you've been here before, then welcome back. We're going to be starting in 30 seconds. All you need is a scrunched up sock if you're at home or a scrunched up piece of paper if you're playing in school. And again, it's a bonus if you have a drink of water. We're gonna be starting in 10 seconds. So all the activities that we're going to be doing today are gonna to be centered on throwing. So if you mess up some of the catches, nobody cares. It's all to do with the throwing. So if you can have access to a wall, that would be superb. If you don't, don't worry about it. You can still do the activities without a wall. So we're going to start with our blue set of activities. They're going to be the warm up. We're then going to move on to our purple challenges that are a little bit more difficult. And then we're going to finish with some rock hard challenges, which are going to be the orange ones. Let's start. So our first warm up, we're going to look at doing the underarm throw. And you've got a couple of choices. You can either just throw the ball underarm to yourself. If you catch it, great. If you drop it, great. It doesn't really matter. It's the throwing that we're looking at. If you've got the opportunity to use a wall, that's even better because you're going to throw underarm to the wall and hopefully it should bounce back somewhere near you. We're going to do each of these warm-up activities for two minutes, fly through it all, and then we'll have a big competition at the end. So, two minutes throwing underarm against a wall. Off you go. Again, if you don't have access to a wall, it's not a problem. You can just throw it underarm to yourself. When the ball bounces off the wall, it may be that you catch it, that's fine. It may be that when it bounces back, it just goes somewhere near you. When we enter the competition, that's worth a point as well, because remember, we're working on the throwing aspect of thing. We're not really too worried about the catching for now. So there's a few top tips that you can do use when you're doing this. First thing you're going to do is with your arm, you're going to have it held down by your side. And all you're going to do is push the ball forward. And the real trick is figuring out when to open your hand. If you open your hand too early, your piece of paper just falls to the floor. If you open your hand too late, it just goes up rather than bouncing off the wall and coming back to you. So the challenge here through trial and error is figuring out when to open your hand so that it bounces off the wall and comes back to you. We're going to do this for one more minute. We always try and use both hands when we have the opportunity. And if you'd like to get a little bit more power into your throw, instead of just throwing it from your hips, you can swing your arm further behind you so that you have more momentum going forwards. And that'll cause the ball to bounce back a little bit further when it does strike the wall. Again, if you don't have the wall, it's not a problem. It's just a warm up set. So you can just do the throw and catch to yourself. Throughout the activities today, we're gonna to be talking about a lot of different things as well. We're gonna be talking about how the brain actually learns things. We're gonna be talking about success and failure. We're gonna be talking about hydration. We're gonna be talking about neuroplasticity. And we're also gonna be talking about transfer of learning. And all that will become very apparent as we go through the activities. So. Last five seconds, throwing and catching underarm. 
Well done everybody, superb job. We can make sure that we tick that one off. First done. The next one we're going to do is the chest pass. And you might find that you tend to use this in sports like basketball and netball. So all we're going to do is hold the sock or the scrunched up piece of paper almost like you're in the praying position. You're then going to lift your elbows up and then push the ball out in front of you. Even better if you can do this against a wall and bounce back and catch. Two minutes, off we go. We're going to have the ball hitting the wall, bouncing back to us. If you're using a piece of paper, by the way, your activity is going to be even more difficult because with the piece of paper, as you can see, it's not perfectly round. So when it hits the wall, it will bounce off at different angles, which makes the catching bit that little bit more difficult. So our hands in the prayer position, and then we push. And again, part of the challenge is figuring out when we're going to open our hands. If we do it too late, it just falls to the floor. If we do it too early, it just falls to the floor. So the challenge, figure out when you're going to open your hands so that you can get the ball going in the direction that you want it to. I've dropped the ball a few times already. And although you might think it's a failure, because it kind of is, it didn't work how I wanted it to, but your brain's very clever because we can learn through two different things. We learn from things when they go right and we call that success. And we also learn when things go wrong. And we sometimes call that failure, but it doesn't really matter because each time the brain learns, if it's something that works, the brain thinks, ah, we're onto something. I'm going to make sure I do something similar to that again. And every time we fail, the brain thinks, right, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to change it for next time. And that's how we go about learning. So if it's a success, if it's a failure, it doesn't really matter. We are continuing to learn. And that's why we come to school, right? To learn, to practice and to get even better than we already are. So. Take a moment to catch your breath. We've done the chest pass. This one's one of my favorites. Now we're going to do the under leg pass. And as always, you've got a choice. You can either throw the ball under your leg, up to yourself, or again, if you've got access to a wall, you're going to throw against the wall so that it bounces and comes back to you. As always, when you get the chance, make sure you practice with both hands and both legs. Two minutes, off we go. Again, if you fail and the ball hits the floor, that's completely fine. It's just your brain working out things that don't work so that then hopefully we can learn how things do work. It's a little bit like Cluedo if you've ever played that before. In Cluedo, you don't know who it is, but you can work out who it is by working out who it isn't. If you're playing a game that's Tom, Jack, Harry and Peter, and you know it's not Tom, Jack and Harry, then you know it's Peter because it's not the others. And that's kind of how failure works. You learn all the things that it's not, so then you can find the correct answer. And that might be correct answers when you're doing your spellings. It might be correct skills when you're trying sports. The only downside is it takes a little bit of time and effort. But if you have skills like resilience and perseverance, then you can become very, very successful in whatever you choose to do. I know a lot of you at home or in schools, you have those kind of values working on perseverance and resilience. And all that means is that when something's going wrong, you keep trying again and again anyway. And if you're clever, you might do things in a slightly different way to try and get a different outcome. Last 30 seconds on the under leg. And then we've got one more from our warm-up set. If you've just joined us, welcome. We're working on different throwing skills today. We're not really too worried about the catching. That's not the bit we're interested in. Everything is about throwing. And a lot of these skills are going to be transferable into other sports and activities. And we're going to talk about that very soon. Last 10 seconds on this one, the under leg throw. Again, half the challenge is figuring out when to open your hand and make the ball spring out. And relax, fantastic. We've done the under leg throw, which means we have just one more activity left to go as part of our warm ups. And that one is the dart throw. So with the dart throw, 
you're going to take your scrunched up piece of paper or your sock and you're going to hold it between your thumb and your forefinger. And all you're going to do is stand facing forwards. So the walls to the side of you, either to the left or the right. You're then going to turn your head and that's the wall you're going to be aiming at. All you're going to do then is place the ball on your shoulder and then throw it forwards. So your, so your elbow acts a little bit like a hinge. That's the movement that we're going to be doing. It's a little bit like a catapult being pulled back before we fire it forwards. And as always, we make sure that we practice on both hands. Two minutes, off we go. So we spoke briefly before about what we call transfer of learning. And all transfer of learning is, when your body does something in, your brain kind of remembers that thing that it did. So when you do an activity next time, even if it's not completely the same, your brain kind of remembers how to do it because it's done a similar thing before. And I'll give you an example. If you've played sports where you've played, let's say, cricket before, your brain will have lots of examples about how to throw and catch the ball. If you're in a situation where you've never played dodgeball before, but you've played a lot of cricket, you're probably going to be quite good at dodgeball. Now dodgeball is a different sized ball, the sport's different, the ball might travel at a different speed, it's a slightly different shape to a cricket ball as well because the cricket balls have the seams in the middle. But even though it's a different type of ball in a different sport, your body and your brain still knows how to throw and catch, even though it's a ball that you might have never caught before. And that's all because of transfer of learning. Your brain's very good at recognising things that's happened before and then using that information and applying it to a new situation. You might have a hobby of knitting, in which case you're probably going to be very good at using your fingers and using bits of thread. You might never have done sewing before, but if all of a sudden you get given a needle and thread, you might be able to be very good at sewing because you've practiced the knitting before. So all of these activities, they might not be necessarily perfect for any one sport, but the skills that we're practicing at the moment, it helps our brain to have like a huge stockpile of information. So when we come up with a new situation, a new sport, a new physical activity, our brain will think, ah, I know how to do this because I've done something similar before. And that something similar is going to be used in these 12 activities. One minute left. You'll notice transfer of learning as well if you're doing things like spellings. You'll notice that certain words tend to finish in the same thing. It might finish in an ED. It might finish in A-T-E. It might finish in T-I-O-N. So if you've got two words that sound similar, even if you've never spelt the other word, you could probably have a pretty good guess. Not because you've spelt the word before, but because you've spelt other words that are quite similar sounding to that word. And that's another example of transfer of learning. Our brain remembers things and then we can use it and apply it to new situations. Right, that's the dart done. Well done everybody, we're already a third of the way through the exercises. So we're going to take a one minute break now, because I know it's hard work, and you've got a choice of three different things you can do. Option one, grab yourself a drink because it is quite warm and hydration is important and we'll talk about that in a moment. Option two, quickly go around nice and safely collecting all the balls or the scrunched up pieces of paper that are on the floor. There's several on the floor in front of me because I've dropped them. I failed. I'm fine with that because it helps my brain to learn. Or option three, if you're already ready, then you might go and practice one of those again. You've got one minute, off you go. You can see just how many I've dropped on the floor. As I mentioned before, as far as I'm concerned, that's a good thing. Every time I succeed, my brain learns. Every time I fail, my brain learns. That's what we're here to do. We're here to learn, to practice and to get better. We're going to make a start on our next activities. The, 
the purple ones, which are slightly tougher, and we're going to be doing that in the next 30 seconds. Last 10 seconds or so, make sure you've got yourself ready, make sure the chair's pushed under. If you're at home, make sure you're in a nice open space because these activities are gonna be a little bit more difficult and they're going to involve a lot more movement of your whole body. So the first one we're going to do is the shot put. And some of you might be familiar with this. It's an Olympic event that looks a little something like that. That's the throw that we're going to be doing. At the Olympics, instead of using socks, they tend to use big spherical pieces of metal. They're very, very heavy, which makes it much further to, much difficult, makes it much more difficult to throw further. I got there in the end. With socks and pieces of paper, it's going to be a little bit easier. So this is how it's going to look. You're going to start almost like you're using the sock to make a phone call, but instead of holding it by your ear, you're going to hold it just by the start of your jawline just there. All you're going to do then is lift your elbow up and then extend your arm upwards. This one isn't a throw, it's a pushing action. So you can even have your hand open the whole time and all you're going to do is push the ball so it goes up and comes back down. From there, push up and it'll come back down. Two minutes to practice, make sure you do it on both hands. Off we go. You might even be able to throw and catch with the same hand. But again, it's not a throwing motion, it's a pushing motion. But we can still use that to move our ball from one place to another place. If you've got a wall in front of you, you can carry on using that, but just push the ball 45 degree angle so it pushes against the wall and comes back. With these next activities, you can generate even more power as well by bending your knees. So if I'm about to do the shot put throw, I can go here, I can also bend my knees, so now I've got a lot of stored energy. When I straighten my knees, my body lifts up and so does the ball. So if I move my body up and time it so my arm goes up at the same time, the ball's gonna travel upwards at a much quicker rate because my legs and my arms are coming up. So then if I push at the right time, I can get even more power onto my throw. Again, if we drop it, that's fine. If you catch it, that's fine. It's throwing that we're working on, not the catching. So again, bend your knees if you need to put more power on it. And again, if you're trying with that piece of paper, it is much, much harder. So again, open hand each time, we're going to balance it. Having it close to our jaw, almost like we're making a phone call. Extend our legs, push, and then try and catch. Last 30 seconds. Make sure you practice on both sides. You'll notice that this one's a lot more difficult than the other activities we've been doing. We're having to use more parts of the body. We're now moving up and down. And for some of you, this might be a bit of a novelty movement. All we mean by novelty is it's a little bit more creative and it might be something that you haven't done before. A lot of us have thrown a ball before, sure, but a lot of us might have not pushed the ball before. And a throw and a push are two different actions, but each time you do it, your brain starts to learn different things. So we can tick that one off. The next one is going to be the football throwing, and this is going to be the two-handed overarm throw. So it's not just using football, you can use it in a range of other sports as well. So if you remember the chest pass, where we have the ball in the praying position, it's a little bit like that, but we're going to have our hands cupping around the ball to make sure we've got a nice good grip on it. Hands above and just behind your head. And then as you move your hands forward, you're gonna figure out when to let go of the ball. If you let go of the ball at the right time, it should hit the wall and bounce back. Two minutes, off you go. A two-handed throw. We start with the ball behind the head and as we move it forwards and start to straighten our arms out, we figure out when to open our hands. If we do it too late, it just goes to the floor 
And if we do it too early, then it doesn't really go in the intended path. And we call this trial and error. When we trial things, it just means that we, we practice doing something. So we're practicing over and over again when to open our hands. And it's called an error because things usually go wrong. So we keep throwing, it'll go wrong. We throw, it'll go wrong. We throw, it'll go wrong. We throw, it'll go wrong. We'll throw and then it'll start going right. Because again, we start to fail our way to success. We start to figure out what doesn't work and we start to figure out when we need to open our hands. For those of you that are quite comfortable with this activity, you're going to take a step back and to make the challenge even more difficult, you're now going to step into your throw. So you're going to have your hands up, you're going to take a step forwards and then throw. Much like the shot put, if our movement's going upwards, that's going to give more power to make the ball go further up. If we're doing a throw forwards and we step forwards, straight away the ball is already moving before we've even moved our arms. And the more movement we can put on the ball, the further it will go. Make sure you practice using each leg coming forwards. I'm going to practice this just for 30 more seconds because it is quite tough. Again, if your ball hits and bounces onto the floor and rolls under a desk, it's not a problem. You can just safely get it back and we can go again. The last 10 seconds on this one. Oops. And time's up, good stuff. We're now going to move on to the backhand throw. And with the backhand throw, you're going to take the piece of paper Hold it in your hand, and you're going to hold it over to your opposite shoulder. So I've got it in my right hand, I'm holding it onto my left shoulder. I'm then going to turn my wrist so that the ball is facing you. Or in this case, it's facing the wall. I'm then going to push my arm out, and as I do, as I straighten my arm, I'm going to open my hand so that the ball flies out. So it should look a little something like that. Against the wall, I'm going to do it, and hopefully I should be able to catch. Two minutes, off we go. So we have the elbow facing the wall, and then as we straighten our hand, we need to figure out when to open it. Again, we open it too early, and it goes off at this angle. We open it too late, and it goes off at this angle. We want it to go more or less forwards, so that it bounces off the wall and comes back to us. There's no rush when you're doing these activities. You can do it nice and slow can take your time, and as always, if it is a little bit too difficult, make sure you get a little bit closer to the wall, so it's a little bit easier. As you become more confident, you might take a few steps back. And again, if you can catch, that's great. If you can't catch, that's great. It doesn't really matter, we're working on the throwing aspect at the moment. So you might notice how this would be handy for some other sports. For example, tennis. If the ball bounces in front of you, you might have to then do a backhand movement to return the ball. It might also be helpful, that kind of movement that you're doing in table tennis. So we've spoken before about the transferability. A lot of these skills we can use in other sports. A lot of you might even notice that this move here is a similar movement to how we throw a frisbee. We've got the ball and we kind of throw it like that. Very, very similar movements. Last 30 seconds on this one. Probably less than that actually, probably about 15 seconds. We're flying through it. To add a little bit more power, you might twist your body as well. So each time, whenever you start moving other parts of your body in the same direction as the ball, that generates more power. So this would be option one for more power. I can start by turning my body further back and then when I spin up and let go, I'm getting much more power on my throw. Fantastic. And the final one, this is probably the most common throw that you'll have practiced the most, is the overarm throw. All you're going to do is start by facing sideways onto the wall. So that's between facing it straight on and being sideways, we're going to be 45 degrees on. 
you're going to have one hand pointing at it. Other hand is going to be back, almost like the shot put, but behind your ear. And then your hands are just going to swap positions. The one at the front is going to come back to your ear, and the one that was at your ear is then going to come forwards. We open our hand to make the throw. And as always, whoops, we practice with both hands. Two minutes, off you go. Practice a few times on one hand, and then a few hand times on the other hand. And again, if you want to add more power, you can always twist the shoulders as well. So instead of throwing just like that, we can then twist the whole body as well. Again, each time we add more movement into the direction of the ball, that gives it more power. And as a consequence, it'll bounce off much, much further. That time, it's so powerful, it actually bounced off and hit me in the face. But that's fine, because we're working on the throwing. We're not trying to catch it with our cheeks or our nose. After this one, we'll have a quick break because if you're anything like me, you will be getting a little bit warm and a little bit sweaty. So just 60 seconds left on this one. See if we can fit in 10 more quality catches, ideally using both hands. We always practice using both hands because if a ball travels on the opposite side of your body, you might not be able to get it with your more, your more dominant hand. So for example, if the throw is going over here, I might not be able to quite reach with my left, my right even, but my left hand will be able to reach. So we practice with both sides so that we're covered for a lot more eventualities. So that said, we're gonna take a 60 second break again and again. You can either grab yourself a little bit of water, you can collect all the balls that may be scattered along the floor, or if you've already got everything all together, then you can practice this for another minute. And again, the more we practice, the better we get. 60 seconds, make a decision and implement it. After this, we're now gonna do the more difficult challenges as well. We're gonna move on to doing the orange ones, which are even more tough than the purple ones. If you're a teacher or a parent at home, and you're taking part in these activities, you'll be able to appreciate just how difficult this is. So as a child, if you're practicing this and it's going a little bit wrong, don't worry about it. We persevere, we're resilient, and we keep going and we keep getting better. Fifteen seconds till we practice the next activity, which is the over shoulder throw. So with the over shoulder throw, all you're gonna do is take the ball and move your hand so that it's behind your back, just like that. Oops. And then all you're going to do is flick your wrist so that the ball moves up. And with a little bit of practice, we can hopefully get the ball to come over our shoulder and catch. It's very difficult, two minutes, give it a go. If you're finding the case where the ball isn't going over your back, again, we can add more power onto the ball. We want the ball to go up, so we can do that by bending our knees and then straightening them so that our body moves up. The more energy we put into moving up, the more the ball is going to move up. So if I do this and then flick, the ball actually goes really high up in the air. Again, we're gonna spend just 90 more seconds on this because it is tough, but you can use your knees, your legs to straighten, so which will give it just a little bit more power when you're throwing the ball over your shoulder. If this activity is genuinely too difficult for you, then there is an easier version. You can just hold out your hand and just throw the ball over like that. So you're throwing over your arm. If you get a little bit more comfortable, you can do the same activity, but do it over your shoulder instead of your arm. 
And once you've got the hang of it, you can then move your hand around the other side and hopefully try and flick it out from behind your back. One more minute on this one. Should be lots of transfer of learning going on. There should be lots of feeling, lots of success as well. Oops. This is probably one of the more difficult throws. So if it's going a little bit wrong and your ball is rolling under someone else's desk, you don't have to worry about it in the slightest. This is a good opportunity for you to work on your perseverance and resilience skills. Even when things are going wrong, how do you react? Do you get a little bit grumpy and a little bit upset? Or do you face the challenge like a hero would? Even when things are going wrong, you carry on moving forward, you keep trying, you keep practicing. That's what heroes do, that's what success is. Trying and trying even when things aren't going your way. Batman wouldn't be a very good superhero if he tried something once, failed, and then went, ah, I'm not going to do this anymore. Every time the Joker gets one up on him, he tries again and again, and eventually he's resilient enough to be successful. It just takes time. It usually takes a couple of hours, that's the length of the movie. Well, last 10 seconds on this one. The more we practice, the better we get. And time's up, I'll do it in a different colour, just so we can see the tick more clearly. The next one is going to be the cricket throw, and sometimes we call this a cricket bowl. So this activity, you're actually gonna do the whole thing with a straight arm. So I've got my ball, I'm gonna put it in my left hand just so it's easier for you guys to see. I'm gonna stand 45 degree onto the wall again, not facing it, not sideways, but sideways on. I'm then gonna have one hand in front and the other hand is gonna be down by the side of my body. I'm then gonna move my arm almost like a windmill action, just like that. And then I need to figure out at what point I'm going to release the ball. Hopefully I'm going to release it when it's somewhere around here so that it hits the wall and then comes back to me. So it should hopefully look a little something like that. Two minutes, off you go. So unlike most throws where we're bending our arm, this one's actually going straight the whole time. It sometimes helps if you give yourself a countdown as well. One two, three. And as always, we practice with both hands. One, two, three. So we can use this throw in cricket. We might use this throw when we're throwing a ball for our dog to try and get. I've even seen this one used as a basketball shot. Defenders in the way, so they couldn't have the ball here when they tried the shot. So actually they had a big sweep round and they ended up throwing it like that to go in the hoop. So don't be fooled that this is only for cricket, it's for a range of different situations. It's a little bit like the movement that we do when we're doing a front crawl, when we're swimming. Last minute on this exercise. And then we've got two more very difficult ones to do before we go into our class competition. Very difficult. It's like the opposite of the underarm throw. The underarm throw, we're doing straight hand like that. This one is going in the opposite direction. It's going overarm. And it's called overarm because the ball, when you let go of it, is over the rest of your arm. And obviously underarm, the ball, is under the rest of your arm. So in case you ever wondered, that's why it's called an overarm throw, because the ball's over the rest of your arm, or an underarm throw because the ball is under the rest of your arm. Fantastic stuff, guys. We can tick that one off. That's the cricket bowling that we've done. Some of you might have done that before. Some of you might even play cricket, in which case you'll have loads of transfer of learning, loads of experience that you can bring across into that throw, which is why you've probably been so successful at it this time. The next one we're going to do, you actually need two balls or two scrunched up pieces of paper. And the LL stands for left, left and the RR obviously stands for right, right. So, with your two balls, 
you're going to throw them both at the same time and you're going to catch the left ball with your left hand and the right ball with your right hand. Two underarm throws. Try and throw and catch. Two minutes, off you go. A double underarm throw. If you feel you're quite good at this activity, you might take a step back. So you need to actually swing your arms and get more power on it. We talked before about momentum. If you're very experienced, instead of doing underarm throws, you might have a go at doing two overarm throws. Trying to get them against the wall and then trying to catch them. The more you practice, the more experience you'll get. And you might notice that that's how something works in computer games. Usually when you're playing computer games, you'll usually have a character that you've got to upskill or level up and unlock, unlock new abilities and the rest of it. You'll notice that the more you practice something with that character, the better you tend to get. It might be casting spells, it might be speed, it might be strength, it might be power, it might be how high that they can jump. And you usually get that experience by completing missions or quests or practicing that same particular skill over and over again. Until ultimately your character is really highly leveled. They might be a little bit OP and they can do whatever they want. They can complete the levels easily and they can take everybody else out. They can get new high scores and the rest of it. We're a little bit like that as humans. I mean, we're not in a computer game, but we can upskill ourselves with the things that we practice. For some of you that have spent a long time practicing guitar, you'll be now really good at playing guitar compared to other people that haven't done it. It's the same with the flute. It's the same with swimming, the same with gymnastics, dance, same with maths, English, science, art, drama, music, history, technology, modern language. Any of the activities that you've tried lots and lots, and you've got lots of practice in, lots of success, lots of failure, if you've managed to do that, then you'll be a kind of superhero at doing that particular sport. So for example, I know a lot of you, especially in the school that I'm thinking of, are very, very good footballers. Well, that's because you've practiced a lot. Of course you're going to be good. So when somebody that's never played football before sees you playing football, they think, wow, it looks like you've almost got a superpower. The way that you control the ball, you keep it close, you glide past defenders, you bend the ball in the top corner. It looks almost magical, it looks effortless, it looks slick, it looks smooth, you make it look easy. It kind of looks like you've got a superpower, that the ball just never leaves your foot. But there isn't actually a superpower about it, it's just because you've practiced lots and lots. Speaking of which, we're now going to practice our final activity. Left hand to right hand, and right hand to left hand. So. The ball in my right, I'm going to throw, and as it bounces, I'm going to catch it with my right. At the same time, the one with my right is going to be thrown and then comes back onto my left. So hopefully, this may go wrong because it is tough. It should look a little something like this. Yes, there we go. So swapping, the ball should move in midair, and then as they come back, we should catch. Two minutes, off you go. So that's kind of how experience works. It's a little bit like a superpower, it's a little bit like a game only it's in real life. And every time we fail a mission or we fail a level in real life, something goes wrong, we misspell something, we get an answer wrong. We just learn that that's how we do something next time. Every time we get something wrong, it guides us a little bit closer to what is right. And you'll notice that on games as well, they actually call it XP, spelt XP or EXP, it's sometimes spelt. And that just means experience. You'll see it on the FIFA games quite a lot as well. You might have someone like Ronaldo or Messi or Mbappe, Neymar, someone like that. And they've got loads of really high scores on each of their attributes, each of their traits, each of their skills. They've got a lot of experience. But you'll also notice sometimes if you've got a younger character, maybe out of the academy and you train and train with them, you get more XP, experience, and the player becomes better. And it's just like that in real life. The more you practice something, the more experience, the more XP you get, 
and then you become better at that thing. We're going to spend 30 more seconds on this one, the crossover, right to left and left to right. And then we're going to have a quick break because this is very, very tiring indeed. And it's Friday as well. A lot of you have had a full week at school. You'll be very tired. You've probably learnt a lot this week as well, which is good. Two more. A throw and a catch. Whoop. And one second left. Just, there we go. Well done, guys. As always, we've done another list of activities. So either get a drink, get all your equipment together, or use this time to keep practicing. One minute, go. We're gonna have a big class competition next. Thirty seconds. Well done for those of you that are already ready. Last ten seconds. You should be getting close to your chairs now, getting ready to start. You should have all your equipment. So we're going to go through each of the activities again, but this time we're only going to do it, because time is flying by, we're only going to do it for 45 seconds. And during that 45 seconds, your challenge is to get as many successful catches as you can in a row, consecutively. So what I mean by that is, if you were to do three successful catches and then drop the ball, three successful throws, sorry, and then drop the ball, your score would be three. If you then pick up the ball and do two more before you lose control of the ball, your score would still be three because that's the highest score that you've got so far in a row. If you pick up the ball and on your next go, you do eight successful throws, then your score would go up to eight. It wouldn't be an eight plus a three, it's just how many you get in a row. So that said, here are the rules. Each has to be a throw either to yourself or to the wall. And if you drop the ball, that's fine you still score a point. It's as long as the ball bounces back and goes somewhere close to your body. So for example, with the underarm throw, I'm going to throw it. It came back pretty close to my body. So that would be worth a point, even though it hit the floor. If I throw the ball when it bounces off miles away, like it did, it almost hit the camera. That's how bad the throw was. That wouldn't be worth a point and I'd need to start my rally again from zero. So that said, 45 seconds, try and get as many as you can in a row that are thrown and come back to you. Starting with underarm, off we go. If you can catch it, that's good because it speeds up the process. But if you can't catch, it doesn't matter. As long as the ball's coming close to your body, that's worth a point. So again, that's worth a point because it came close to my body. For those of you that are warm and are sweating a little bit, that's a good thing. If we're sweating, it's just our body's way of cooling itself down. We said last week that our body isn't a radiator. There isn't a button or a nozzle that we can just turn to cool ourselves down. Instead, our body uses a process called sweating. And then all the warm water that's in our body comes out and that makes our body a little bit cooler. Time's up, 45 seconds. We can take that one off. If you want to share your score with somebody else, you can do. If you just want to keep your score in your head and keep it private, you can do. It's your score, it's up to you what you do with it. Next activity, the chest pass. So again, ball, whoops, in between your hands in the praying position. We're then gonna turn and push the ball out and bring it back. Again, if we don't catch it, but it just comes back close to us, then that's enough for a point. It's only if the ball goes absolutely miles away that it's not worth a point. 45 seconds, go. So there's a problem with sweating. It cools us down, granted, that's great. But the problem is if we keep losing water out of our body, then we can't do things as well. 
We call it dehydration when there isn't enough water in our body. It makes it difficult to think. It makes it difficult to work hard. So we can do what's called rehydration or hydration. And we can do that by putting water in our body by having a nice, nice big drink. Last 10 seconds. And if we have a drink, that puts water back in our body. And the good thing about being hydrated is it's good for your skin, it's good for your hair, it's good for your nails, it's good for your bones, it's good for your muscles, it's good for your brain. It helps you to concentrate, it helps you to think, it helps you to sleep, it helps you to stay nice and cool when things are getting warm, and it helps to give you even more energy so you can do things better for longer. It's awesome. Time's up. Next one we're going to do is the under leg throw. And again, you can either throw that up to yourself or you can throw it against the wall. Remember, we're not too worried about the catching. As long as the throw rebounds close to you, that's worth a point. Go. Funnily enough, water is the second most important thing that you can put in your body. The most important is obviously oxygen, air. If you didn't put air in your body, you wouldn't last very long at all. But the second most important thing is definitely water. So at school, you might always have a water bottle in the classroom. You might have one on the desk, but certainly at break time, lunch time, at breakfast, when you get in from school, we don't need to drink loads and loads and loads and loads of water in one go, but we need to make sure that we're drinking little bits throughout the day. A couple of sips here and a couple of sips there to make sure that our body is full of water, fully hydrated. Time's up. We'll tick that one off. Next one we're going to do, we're flying through this, is we're going to do the dart. So stand forward so that the uh, wall is to the side of you. Take it in two fingers, put it on your shoulder. We're going to bring it back like a catapult. Off we go, 45 seconds, go. Make sure you practice it with both hands as well. A few times with one hand. And then a few times with the other as well. I feel a little bit rude turning my back to you guys. It's quite a rude thing, isn't it, to turn your back to somebody. But obviously we're just doing throws at the moment and you're not actually in the room. You're just on the camera at the moment. Hopefully trying to do the same. 10 seconds left. We're flying through these activities, everybody doing really well. As always, if you've got a piece of paper, the activity's even tougher. It bounces much more and it's harder to catch. Time's up, well done. Good stuff, guys. Next one we're going to do is the shot put. So as we've mentioned with the shot put before, you're going to hold it on your hands. We're not going to grab it because it's not a throw, it's more of a push. So again, you're going to put the ball just between your ear and the start of your, your jawline there. And all you're going to do is push the ball up or if you've got a wall, you can push the ball to the wall. We spoke about before using your legs to give an extra power. So feel free to use that during this activity. 45 seconds, off you go. Get as many in a row as you can. Again, if it hits the floor, that's fine as long as it lands or comes back somewhere near where you are. We practice on our left hand and we practice on our right hand. Remember, it's not a throw. This one's a push. But we're doing throwing activities, Dan. I know, it's close enough. The main thing is that we're building up a list of skills that our brains can use in the future transfer of learning. If ever you do the shot put or another throwing activity in a sport or with the family or in summer, your brain will be able to know what to do because it's done a similar activity before. Time's up. We can tick that one off. That was the worst tick I've ever done. Much better. And now we're going to do the two-handed football throw. So get the ball in there between your hands, just like the praying position we had earlier, but this time you're going to grip the ball hands behind your head, and then we release them both forwards to get the ball, and if you want more power, you're going to step into it and then throw. 45 seconds, go. I 
I know we're not working on catching, but ironically, if your throw is good, then it helps you to catch. If your throw is rubbish, even if you're an amazing catcher, if the throw is rubbish, it's gonna be much more difficult to catch the ball. So if you're very good at throwing, catching will be easier as a byproduct. And all we mean by a byproduct is something that happens because of something else. So if we eat lots of pizza, pepperoni or pineapple on your pizza or whatever, if you eat a lot of pizza, as a byproduct, you become full. You don't feel hungry anymore. If you eat too much pizza, as a byproduct, you start feeling sick because you've eaten far too much. So it's kind of the result of something that happens. We're getting better at throwing. As a byproduct, our catching might improve because we're doing that as well. <clears throat> Take the football one off. Next one, one of my favorites, is the backhand. So again, it's a little bit like throwing a frisbee. Elbow pointed to the wall. The ball is going to make sure that it's on our opposite shoulder. And we're going to push so that the ball comes back to us. 45 seconds. Off we go. All doing really well if you're still here and you're still working hard. These activities are very tough. We've been doing lots of movement with our hands, our fingers, our thumbs, our shoulders, our arms, our elbows, as well as twisting and turning the body, using our eyes to track the ball, bending our knees. So there's an awful lot that we've been doing. But that is physical activity, or at least part of it, moving your body in different ways to get an outcome. Again, you can put more power on it by twisting your body. We can use that if we want our frisbee to go a little bit further. Time's up. Keep working hard, guys. I know it's tiring. The next one is the overarm throw, which is probably the most common. As always, it's a little bit like the shot put, but we grip the ball and our hand starts a little bit further back. And all we're going to do is swap arms. The one at the front is going to come back as the other arm goes forwards. And we always make sure that we swap as well. So 45 seconds. Off we go. Very tough what we're doing here. The final thing we're gonna quickly talk about while we're doing these throws is something called neural plasticity, which sounds like a massive word, neural plasticity. It's actually two separate words, neural, things to do with your brain, and plasticity is something's ability to change over time. Time's up. Going to tick that one off, and now our final four activities. Firstly, the over the shoulder throw. 45 seconds, off you go. We've only got about three minutes and in that time we're gonna do all the activities. Not much longer to go now, just three more left. Four more including this one. So neural plasticity is what occurs when your brain changes because you've done new activities. So your brain is made of hundreds and thousands and millions of different networks. And every time you move, your brain triggers what's called an electronic impulse. Something fires across in your brain and that's what makes you do all these movements. Well, if you first start riding a bike or start swimming, you're not very good at those activities because the brain hasn't built up the network of how to do it. Effectively, you're asking the brain to do something when it doesn't know how to do it. But once you've practiced it lots and lots, swimming, cycling, playing the flute, whatever it may be, your brain eventually recognizes how to do it. So the structure and the way that your brain works is different. So if you play football and you can do around the world and someone else can't, it's because your brain is now structured slightly differently to that other person. Of course it has to be different because if their brain was the same, then they'd be able to do it as well. Take that one off. Next one we're gonna do is the cricket throw. So hands, it's a straight throw over arm. 45 seconds, off we go. So yeah, so when you do activities, your brain will change because you'll learn how to do it. If you play guitar, your brain will change. 
so that you play guitar. And that's how it works. And that phenomena is called neural plasticity. The way that your brain works actually changes based on the activities that you do. You might be really good at chess. You might be really good at archery. You might be really good at badminton. You might be really good at playing racing games on the, on the uh, PlayStation. Whatever it is, your brain will become good at those things because you've practiced it over and over again. So that's why your brain will work slightly differently to somebody else's. And that's part of the reason why we're all different. We've all got different experiences and we've all learned different things as we've gone along. Time's up. And the penultimate one, left, left, right, right. So we're going to throw, ball on your left is gonna come back to your left, ball on the right is gonna come back to your right hand. 60, 45 seconds, off we go. Yeah, neuroplasticity. It's a very, very interesting subject. You can learn far more about it if you just type it into Google, neuroplasticity. Then you'll be able to learn loads of new stuff about it. Which ironically would then mean that your brain is different to other people's because you've gained some extra knowledge. You know some things that other people don't, which is quite cool. Ten seconds left on this one, and then we'll move on to the final one. I want to make sure that we finish a couple of minutes earlier, because teachers, parents, I appreciate, we do need a little transition period. The kids will be warm. We need to put the pieces of paper away, and we might need to even visit the toilet, because we've been working hard for about a minute, uh, about an hour now. And they're probably fully hydrated, hopefully, anyway. Time's up. And the final one, left to right, oh, getting warm here and right to left. So as we throw the balls, they're going to cross over in the air and then we catch them. 45 seconds, the final 45. Let's go everyone. 45 left, let's go. Not long to go now. Make sure the balls swap in midair. If we're getting quite comfortable with it, then we can do the same, but an overarm throw. Very tough. 20 seconds remaining. Let's see if we can just do one, one more with quality. I can't at the moment, I'm doing lots of failing. But that's good because whenever I fail, my brain learns so I can eventually do it. 10 seconds left. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Yes, and time's up everybody, really well worked. We've done a lot of activities there. We've talked about hydration, we've talked about neuroplasticity, we've talked about transfer of learning, we've talked about becoming more experienced, and we've talked about how success and failure are kind of the same thing. It just means that our brain is learning. It's been a pleasure working with you all. Have a great weekend, stay active, stay safe, and hopefully I will see you all again next week. See you all soon, bye.